So Pete, thank you so much for joining us. Let me introduce um, Pete Johnson is a partner with Azimuth Capital Management and Pete runs the firm's San Francisco Bay Area office and focuses on investments in energy transition and sustainable assets. Uh, prior to joining Azimuth, Pete was co-founder, president, and chief technology officer of Monolith Materials Incorporated, a company that secured, developed, and commercialized technology for producing industrial-grade hydrogen and carbon materials from natural gas with significant environmental and economic advantages over incumbent methods. Monolith is now operating a full-scale commercial facility in Nebraska that is the only large-scale pyrolysis hydrogen plant in the world. Prior to forming Monolith, Pete led engineering and product development for Ariva Solar and spearheaded the manufacturing and construction of a 125 megawatt solar plant in Rajasthan, India, after successfully merging the company uh, Osra with Ariva. Pete received a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford University, and prior to that, he graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Utah. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of California and is an inventor on 12 patents. He serves as a director for Monolith Materials and as an advisor to the U.S. Department of Energy. Okay, Pete, thank you so much for, um, for joining us today. And uh, as with all of these uh, presentations or discussions, we, uh, we try to put together the bio and we, we start looking at some of the experiences that that you have had, and um, they are there. Are, there are many experiences to, to highlight. So, of the experiences that you've had as an entrepreneur and as an investor, um, what have been some of the highlights for you uh, as a professional? Oh, I mean, I, I think one of the first ones was I, I uh, you know, I did engineering work at Stanford, and I got pulled into a startup working on medical devices and I was working on these these tiny things that that you know I was working on devices that went into your airway through your nose so I I had my hands up my own nose all the time testing things out and and you know like I was a young engineer I was I was ambitious and pushing the limits and I you know I, I was doing all kinds of stuff with testing devices on my own face and and uh, you know, it was interesting work, but I kind of felt like, you know, this is, it was more art than science. And, and I read a book, um, uh, the building of the Panama Canal, which is this grandiose infrastructure project. And I, I just kind of, something clicked in my head and I said, you know, I chose to be an engineer because I wanted to build big things. You know, I wanted to build big machinery and this and that. And I, you know, here I was working on these tiny medical device things, because that's where, that's sort of where the venture market was for engineers in, in the Bay Area when I came out. And so I kind of switched right then and I decided I was going to go into into renewable power and clean tech. Just right then I said, I, you know, I want to do that and I want to build big things. And I ended up really lucking out and getting an offer to jump into a startup called Osra that was, you know, backed by Kozla Ventures and Kleiner Perk and some of the biggest names, you know, really audacious goals. But it the job ended up I ended up in the Australian desert, you know, within like two months working on a big solar plant installation. And I was chasing kangaroos out from under mirrors. And I, you know, and I just remember this moment of sort of feeling like I found my, I found my calling of, of being out in the, in the fresh air with a hard hat on trying to solve really challenging engineering problems. And then, you know, at the same time, kind of thinking through, okay, how do we solve these problems and then actually scale this business? And, and it was, that's kind of like the first time I really felt like I was, I kind of was swinging the bat as, as, as hard as I wanted to and was kind of hitting on full cylinders. So that, that's kind of one highlight I remember is just being outside in the dust, you know, building projects. Um, Sounds like a big scary. <laughs> Yeah, it was a big transition and it was it was sort of it was the right transition for me and who I was and I've, I've sort of built big energy projects and energy companies ever since then and it's that that's that's kind of the that was sort of the the chrysalis of it, I guess. Did you have a, a mentor or somebody who helped you kind of navigate that that pivot in your professional life I mean it sounds like it was quite a leap not only. Uh, in terms of the subject that you were working on, but even just where you were physically in the world and how that how that affected you personally, did you have somebody who kind of helped you through that? Yeah, so I I am um, you know like 
engineering is engineering, like engineering methodology is kind of the same across things. And, you know, like it's a matter of learning. There's a lot of tricks to the trade and learning and applications learning. But, you know, I was working on really complicated optics with with my the medical device work. We were we were using ultraviolet light and fiber optics and reflectors. And I, I looked at what I was doing and I said, I really want to be in clean energy. And optics makes a lot of sense when you're talking about solar power and when you're talking about concentrating solar. So I, I joined a company that used giant mirrors to reflect light onto pipes and heat them up to make steam. And it was actually, fundamentally, it was actually really similar to me trying to use reflectors to channel ultraviolet light into fiber optics. And so that actually like subject matter the scale was different, but it was actually doing kind of the same stuff. But the, you know, the first mentor I had was a guy, he was a Stanford alum. And I just, you know, it was a guy I picked out of, off of a list and I asked if I could buy him lunch. He was in the energy industry. And I just told him, I said, look, I want to be in the energy industry. I've been working in med device. How do I make this transition? And he gave me some great advice. And then he said, I actually just decided I was going to jump in and help found this company, Osra, you know, you want to interview for a, for a position, you know, as, as the first engineer that we hire in the US. And so pure serendipity that I took this guy out to lunch as opposed to somebody else out. Um, and then, you know, I ended up having some interviews, but these guys are great. They, it was a US company, but they had bought an Australian business and they were planning on sort of moving the tech over. So for my interview, I basically had to fly over to Australia and work out in the field with these guys for three days. That's how they decided I was I was, you know, tough enough to handle the job. So that, that's how I ended up. But most of my work was actually in the U.S. I built solar plants in Bakersfield, California, Arizona, New Mexico. And, and we ended up building a big, big project in Australia and a very big project in India. So. Wow. Okay. So it's quite a range of experiences that that transition led yep. to. Uh, it sounds like um, you guys also had uh, some intellectual property that was probably uh, part of the transition to get the company kind of scaled and uh, and spread out geographically. Yeah, I mean, it was it was in just an interesting experience all around, and one that like challenged just multiple areas of like business management and and you know team building and things like that. So, as an engineer, did you um, did you engage in any sort of training as a business a business professional? Do you engage in um, ongoing trainings to uh, to uh, to kind of hone your business acumen. Uh, mostly kind of on the job stuff, you know. Like I kind of have this attitude that if you you know if you uh, hit the ball out of the park anytime the, a pitch is thrown to you, you just you end up you know getting a lot of opportunities thrown your way and, and that's always the guidance i give to young professionals who you know everybody wants to know when they're going to be promoted <laughs> i always just say blow us away with what you're doing right now and like the answer will become obvious so it, it was kind of like that when i was in the solar industry there weren't that many old gray-haired people who knew what they were doing because it was a new industry so young young people who worked really hard and and were confident in what they were doing, just were handed a lot of opportunities that otherwise you might have to wait in line a long time to get. And that that's kind of what happened is, you know, I, I started out in a very technical position, but, you know, within a few years, I was managing, you know, a large team of people. And, and then you, you start sitting in on the, the strategic meetings and, you know, talking to, to the commercial folks and making commercial presentations. And after a while, you've, found yourself, you know, learning how to negotiate commercial deals and it, just very organic. I did one kind of week long leadership training session at Duke University, but I mean, it was more like, it's more like learning how to, you know, like build bridges with logs and build teamwork than, than actual business skills. Fair, so fair, fair. I think most of it's just sort of, you get thrown in there and you either sink or swim. So it sounds like a big part of uh, of what you do too is team building and finding the right the right teams for the right projects. Um, so you know we talk a lot in in the university about collaborating with with others and the importance of bringing other people to your project to bring that to light. Have you uh, through your endeavors ever had the chance to work with a university partner, or faculty members from uh, from you know, your past, uh, you mentioned the Stanford alum being one of the first contacts that you made. 
um, mm -hmm. solar, have, have other academic contacts led you to, to other opportunities? Absolutely. I mean, look, I, I, and I still have good contacts from, I, so I went to the University of Utah for undergrad and I went to Stanford for graduate school and I still have good contacts at both of those schools that I sort of bouncing around with. I mean, I'm, I'm talking with one of my old University of Utah contacts right now about a lithium opportunity. So yeah, no, I still stay pretty connected. I, I give a lot of guest lectures at Stanford and, you know, it, yeah, I stay connected pretty, pretty well. That's great. You know, we're going to tap in to, to, um, to, to people who are willing to engage with, with universities and um, uh, startups especially can be, it can be a difficult time to, to manage all of the different priorities. You know, if you're trying to manage collaborations, if you're trying to pitch to investors um, and, you know, one thing that we're always trying to, to train people on is that pitch. And so if you, were, if you were to give a faculty member or somebody who is an academic researcher some tips on you know, how to get your best message out uh, in a pitch, what would, you, what would you say to somebody who's, you know, obviously you've got limited time to, to communicate your message, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think you've got to be able to explain a business in a, in a few minutes to have it make sense. I, I mean, there are, there are really complex businesses out there where people are successful, but I think generally the more complex a business is, it is the harder it is to succeed. And so when you're, when you're pitching new businesses, you should be able to explain, you know, who's going to pay you money for what in a, in a pretty straightforward path. I mean, a lot of times somebody will pitch a business to me and I'll, I'll end saying, who's going to pay you for this and how much will they pay you? Like, help me, help me draw a line from you saying this is going to be a billion dollar business to who's, who are actually going to be your top five customers. Right. So, so I think just being, being clear and realistic about what it is you're selling and who's going to pay for it and, you know, explain the problem, explain the solution, and then talk about who's actually going to pay you money because that's how a business has to work. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a person I talked to once who, they intro their business by saying they were going to change man's relationship with water. <laughs> and I said, what, what does that mean? Like, am I still going to drink it? They said, oh yeah, you're going to drink it. And I said, well, what are you doing then? And it, I had to like peel back layer after layer to actually figure out what they're doing because it, somehow they had like seen some tweet from Elon Musk and decided it'd be better to be mysterious than to actually just be clear. And I mean, look, like if you're a professor and you think about teaching something with brevity and clarity, that's how you need to present a business plan. Great, 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 great advice. advice. Um, so uh, when, you are, uh, when you're looking for folks to join your teams, what are some of the top skills that you are looking for um, in people that, that, you're, that you're gonna ultimately rely on to help build uh, your projects or your businesses? So it, that's really a, a question of it depends on the stage of the business. If you're if you're if you're just starting out and it, it, you're you're trying to build a team of four, who's going to go out and like figure out a business and get traction and you know solve a technical problem, you want people who are you know hardworking, um, team players, low ego, and just like you want people that you are simpatico in many regards because you don't want to have to be dealing with politics and this and that like you just want to get after it so like early stage you just want doers you know like as a company grows you start hiring like specialists for certain roles here and there and so your culture tends to change as a company grows but er early in i think you you know if i'm a founder and i've got a cool business i want to build I want to hire people that I know, number one, I know them well, I like working with them, I can see myself spending 50 hours a week with them day in day out, and people who I know aren't going to care about what their title is or what the, you know, who's doing what, um, you just like, that's the, mo the most important, important part of team culture for the first 10 employees is just who you hire, like, and you just have to hire people you like working with. Sounds like good advice. Good advice. So is there anything that else that you would offer to folks uh, to wrap up the, the conversation? Um, you know, look, I, I think if you if you want to be an entrepreneur, 
let me, let me put it this way. So when you, when you're working on a home, I were, I do a lot of home improvement projects and I get them in my head. I want to do this. I would do that. And I think about it all the time. I try to optimize. And then when it comes time to actually do it, you just kind of got to cut a hole in the wall um, so that you're stuck with that project. And you got to go do it. Right. And, and there's a lot of people who sort of fancy the idea of being an entrepreneur and starting a business, but they almost like the idea of thinking about it more than they like doing it. And so, you know, sometimes you got to just like take that first step that forces you to actually now take the next step. Um, otherwise, it, it just becomes a theoretical conversation you have in your mind all the time. So I would say, you know, first bit of information is just, you know, if you if you have the the, you know, the inclination to do it, go out and do it, you know, and then and most of us will solve those problems as they come towards us and can figure it out. Not everybody, not everybody is successful. Make sure you got a plan B, but you know, I just cut a hole in the wall and go start, go start working on it, you know. Well, I think that's a, that's a great analogy. You got to start cutting a hole in the wall. It sounds like a good spot. Yeah, you're stuck, you're, you're stuck with it then. You either got to patch the wall or, you know, do something. Right. Yeah. Well, hey, Pete, thank you so much for taking time with us today. We really appreciate it. And um, we'll follow up with uh, some Q&A. So please stay on the line, those of you who are watching. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you there. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, as much as I hate to watch myself on video, there we were. Um, so uh, thank you guys um, for, for joining us. I know we had some people join in um, during the presentation, but we're gonna host a Q&A now for folks who um, wanna have Q&A. And uh, please feel free to turn on your cameras. Um, and we have a small enough group that I think people can just um, either use the, either use the um, reaction, the hand, uh, the thumbs up, or you can raise your hand under the participants list if you're savvy enough to do that. And we can go from there if anybody has questions. Um, and thanks again for joining us. And just a reminder again, um, for those who did join um, at the end or in the, in the middle there is that on April 23rd, we'll have the next uh, one of these startup stories. Um, it'll be airing at 1 p.m. and we'll be talking with Shelly McGuire to hear about some of her experiences. Um, and I see uh, we've got a question. Will this presentation be made available offline? Yes, and thank you for bringing that up. This is being recorded. So just be aware that if you do raise a question, it will be, um, it will be part of the recording once this uh, is available on the Tech Transfer website. Pete was just so thorough that we don't have any questions. <laughs> Fine with me. <laughs> well, Pete, we appreciate your time today and um, we appreciate you uh, giving us a chance to hear about some of your experiences. Um, uh, we've got folks on the line who, uh, you know, have been listed as inventors on patent applications, who have um, shown interest in start, uh, starting companies, uh, maybe who have started companies uh, um, uh, as well. And so, you know, we've got a, um, uh, a growing support system here in Idaho for, for people who want to start companies. And this is just like, a small part of that. It looks like Hassan, Hassan Jamil, and you have to pardon me if I botch your name, but. Sure. Uh, so this is a two part question, one for Pete, one for Jeremy. Um, I'm an University of Idaho CS professor. Uh, I started a small uh, startup um, last year and then the COVID struck. So basically I'm sitting at home. Um, but uh, this is a more IT based company. And I was wondering if uh, UI tech transfer, uh, how does it relate to SBI, RSTTR kind of thing uh, to start off the idea of a uh, company? Meaning that, uh, do you see uh, for Pete, university partnership is a good way of starting things or you go off on your own? Um, it depends on the project too, but yeah. in general. Well, look, I mean, I've never been a professor. I was almost a PhD student, but I, I decided to bail on it and, and left with a master's degree. So that's, that's as far as I went, as far as academic um, credentials. I did good before I went. Before I went to Stanford, I um, actually worked in a sort of a consulting group at the University of Utah called the Lausanne Center, 
I helped get this started. And we, we actually did work for the technology licensing office at the University of Utah. So we, we actually worked a lot with professors who wanted to start businesses. That was kind of our role was to help them figure out how to start businesses. And, and I think, I mean, good idea, bad idea. I think if you're employed by a university and you come up with a, with a great idea, you know, working with grant money that's tied to your role in the university, I think, you know, in general, the university owns it. And yeah. you know, lots of professors hate that, but that's, yeah. kind of, that's kind of how it works. It's the same if you're, if you're working for a company and you come up with an idea, the company owns it and they don't, they don't give you the right to license it and start it up. So it's better than companies, but in general, I think you're kind of stuck with it unless you can clearly show that you came up with that in work completely detached from your role, but that generally that's hard. So the, the, the next layer of that question is, you know, what is sort of the best format for an agreement that you could, you might reach with your university um, to, to give you a leg up in, in starting a business? And, and, you know, I think the technology licensing offices 20 years ago generally just tried to license tech out to the highest bidder and, and didn't necessarily have great support structures for entrepreneurs within faculty who wanted to actually keep it themselves and build a business. And I think, you know, Look, Stanford making money on Google, I think, happened to change some people's perspectives on how universities actually make a little bit more money by supporting entrepreneurism out of the school. Um, one of the structures that I really like, and I helped push at the University of Utah, and the, and, and the University of Utah is really good at doing this, Stanford and MIT were kind of, we, we sort of modeled what we did on that, is a university going pretty light on the royalty side right because you know when when you're when you're clamping down on revenue and it's an early startup right that's the oxygen that's that's the oxygen mm -hmm. line and so light on revenue heavy on the university actually taking an equity stake or in in cases where a university legally can't do that and a synthetic equity type stake where it's you know they they have skin in the game for broad success of the business but they're willing to forego royalties for the first 5 years the more you can, the more, and, and I'm probably like stepping in and, you know, making no, no, it. You're, 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 you're great. <laughs> no, absolutely. The more you can push, you can push a university's upside kind of down the road and align them with the success of the, of the invest, investors you might need in the business or the success of yourself as an entrepreneur, the easier that is then for people who, to, who can finance the business. Because if they see the university sitting across the table from them and antagonistic to their desires to build the business, it becomes really challenging. Um, yeah. so, and just one other topic on that, sometimes a, university's, a university will contract with a patent law firm. Um, and so you, you're as a professor, you say, hey, I got this great invention, then the university takes it to their patent law firm. And the law firm, the patent law firms, I don't know if anybody here is a patent lawyer. And, and so I'm going to apologize in advance. I've never presented anything to a patent lawyer who he said I couldn't, who said I couldn't patent that. And, and, and the, no lawyers ever say that you lose. Right. So, so, so you, you don't actually get great feedback from a patent lawyer on is this patentable? They'll always find some tiny, tiny lane that you can patent something in. So you can't trust that. You just, but you know, like getting the university's help on figuring out, is there really a business here? Maybe you get a business school student or a finance student to do some market research. Like you can use all these resources to, as a launch pad and you, you should in a university spectrum and then align the university with the investors. That's sort of my advice. So for Jeremy, the, the issue is that um, as a company, think, think, think myself as outside the university as a company. I have an interest, right? Uh, the question is that how the university is going to help encourage entrepreneurship by helping me not kind of like putting obstacles because I think that the key to the whole thing is that unless you protect my interest, I'm not going to be interested in doing anything, right? So, and without me doing anything, you're not getting any equity or royalty, whatever anyway. So the question is that, is there a sweet medium somewhere that you can have some of it, but not really take the oxygen out of me because I'm going to have to manage it. I have to go to find investors, invest my money and everything. 
Because yeah, so the, the type of structure that Pete talked about in terms of a low a low royalty rate or a, a zero royalty rate in exchange for uh, exactly. low, uh, higher liquidity down the road, that's exactly what we do. That's the structure for startup licensing, absolutely. So if you'd like to talk offline about specifics, I'd be sure. more than happy to, absolutely. Sure. We do have a question in the chat that I want to address sure. before we, we close the call here. Um, I work in agriculture with farmers, a lot of farmers invent machines and other things for farms. What advice can you give for farmers inventions? When to patent? Also, what energy transformations do you see for agriculture? Broad question, Iris, thank you for turning your camera on. We can see you now and we see your Vandals logo in the back there. So, um, you know, just as with anything, you got to be timely with your patenting and you got to be um, knowledgeable about when you're disclosing those inventions. So any public disclosure, and that's really, really, really broad in the patent, patent office's view, any public disclosure, anything that was not under confidential uh, exchange can spoil your, your chance for obtaining a patent on your invention. So mind when, you, um, when you're disclosing to other people and who you're disclosing to and under what circumstances, maybe fill, uh, request a non-disclosure agreement if you can't describe your invention in non-confidential ways. Um, so practicing talking about your invention or discovery in non-confidential ways, uh, that's one skill to help build um, when you're trying to attract people to help commercialize your, your um, idea. So that's, that would be my advice. Yeah, and, and Iris, look, I would say that farmers are probably some of the most innovative people in the universe. A lot of times because they've figured out how to like fix a tractor with baling wire, right? I mean, you know, you know like <laughs> some of the things you see on a small farm are, are just mind boggling. Um, you know, look, I, I, I think as far as patenting, there's, the, the, the resources to actually go on and see like has anybody done this before if, if, if you spend if you spend two hours looking at Google patents you like you won't it, it's not as good as having a patent attorney go do a, a patent search for you but you can kind of see hey have, have 10 people already solved this problem or not you can kind of feel it figure out is this like are there are there do I automatically find 10 or do I find one that seems like it's kind of like what I'm doing? The other thing that, that's challenging is people write patents now with an intention to be unclear. And they basically, they'll, they'll write a patent and they'll talk about a thousand ways to do something. And it's not clear, but they basically do it with this intention of trying to be as broad as possible. So um, one of the things that's important to know when you're raising money or trying to build a business, a patent is part of the equation. You kind of want to have an ability to protect somebody else from making something identical to yours. But if it's if it's like a challenging thing to make, sometimes it's just just the know-how and like launching the product is actually more valuable. So, so you should you should tell clients and people don't always get caught up in whether there's a patent. If it's just a really good solution and you can get some traction and be first to market, you can still build a business. And, and like, I, I think people get overly caught up. Patents are important, nice to check the box. You'll almost always be able to find a way to patent something about what you've done. I mean, you could patent, you know, combination of like a red sweater with a green tie in some way, you know, like literally, I, I just, it's not that, patents are not that hard to get. Um, and it's more about execution. On the trends and the trends in agriculture and energy transition, um, the, the the things that I see coming that are interesting. One, and and I think a lot of people have seen this is sort of AI, you know, um, uh, remote sensing, these types of things. You know, automated vehicles. You know, you guys have seen sort of robotic, you know, robotic grain harvesters that are driving unmanned. That's autonomous vehicles and AI, that stuff, that, that's real. That, that's real. Um, and I, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, I think uh, there's, a, there's a big thing around soil and you know, soil science, sequestering carbon in soil, um, you know, uh, no-till agriculture, these types of things, and, and can can we find ways to actually get value recognition for certain agricultural practices that reduce carbon, right? Like, I think that's a big trend that's coming and people are trying to figure that one out. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, 
you know, another area that I've, I've seen some really interesting things is, is trying to reduce ammonia use, going to biologics or other nitrogen fixing things beyond just sort of standard ammonia-based fertilizer because of some of the knock-on effects that ammonia has on waterways and algae, algae blooms. So, you know, I, I sort of think AI and machine learning is one area, drones and, and the way those are impacting agriculture, and then kind of soil science between carbon and reducing ammonia. Th those are the areas that I think are, are really compelling, but there's, there's 10 other areas. I think ag is wide open with huge opportunities. And, you know, if, if University of Idaho, um, you know, would have an opportunity to be a huge leader in this space, as you sort of think through, you know, ag, ag un universities with big ag department, they invest heavily in combining ag with some of these other techs. I, I think there's massive, massive playing field in front of you. Well, on that note, very positive note, Pete, thank you again for, uh, for your time, Iris. Thank you for your question and, and thank you uh, others for your questions as well. I put a link in the chat box um, for those of you who are University of Idaho folks and would like to um, continue the discussion uh, more personally, uh, please feel free to follow up using the ticketing system and we can um, uh, get you set up with whatever services you might need from our office. So um, thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you next time. Okay, great. Nice, nice to see y'all. Appreciate it.